The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. One of the things that uh, that I've enjoyed over the years is not just teaching a message, but coming out of that which is rich in the way of personal experience. Let that be the message. That's more important than a lot of teaching, right? How many have noticed that in the early years, uh, you had Women's Aglow and Full Gospel Businessmen, and they were giving testimonies. And we were seeing more changed lives with testimonies. Why? Because a testimony was not a sermon. A testimony was a life encounter and an experience, and it creates life. It has life, and it gives life. And so we just want to thank the Lord for he who began that good work in us is going to continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. Good, good morning. Anybody see the size of this Bible? <laughs> I have very few versions that, uh, that I'm really in love with, um, but this is one of them. It's uh, the Witness, Witness Lee's recovery version. Um, there's so much uh, that he wrote in it, and he had such a close relationship with the Lord that it's the, the, the footnotes under this thing is, is just immensely wonderful to read, you know, when the Lord gives you something. But, but anyway, it was actually made to intimidate you guys as I walk up. <laughs> this is the real Bible. <clears throat> Not really. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for this wonderful day. We thank you, Father, for, the, for our progressive healing that's happening even now. We just, we just ask, Lord, that you would be with us today. We know you are. And we just praise you and worship you for who you are. I had this amazing thing happen to me on Pi Day. How many of you know what Pi Day is? It's, it's kind of a nerd thing. It's <laughs> March 14th because it's the circumference uh, of a circle based on its diameter. It's 3.1415, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. So it's March 14th. March 14th, God spoke to me in a really interesting way. Um, I was praying with a, with a, with a young man um, earlier in the week, and, and I felt like when I was praying with him, I was also asking it for myself, and I said, Lord, just have him, you know, I was just asking the Lord to speak plainly to, to him at, as far as some of the different choices that he needed to make and, and things. Just, just speak plainly. You know, um, Jesus spoke in parables so that he would be able to speak plainly to those and have them understand the kingdom that, that weren't, that, and, 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 and spiritual things um, and get concepts that they normally wouldn't have gotten at all. It would have been nonsense to them. And so I said, if Jesus did it, and that's how he speaks. Lord, I want that too. You know, I was praying it for this young man, but I, I was like, Lord, just speak plainly to me. This, this next week and and what was what came out of it was really interesting on the on the 14th he woke me up with a vision and I don't normally have a lot of I don't have a lot of visions it is is like I'm I'm actually seeing this playing with my eyes open playing out like a like a like a like a dream but was wide awake and what I saw was a, a stage and it was kind of like a reward ceremony of some sort or, or an awards you know something that you would see televised normally and the opening act was a comedy a, a well-known comedian and while he was going through his comedy routine I was waiting for him to start bashing the, the president and bashing you know this and that and and it wasn't. It was okay. It was relatively clean. 
which is not, was abnormal for this particular person that he showed me. And, and it just kept going on and on. And I was like, this is, this is really strange because I'm, I'm, ser I'm, I'm actually seeing this in front of me happening. Wide awake. And I was like, okay, what, what, are, you, what are you showing me here? And while he was speaking and he was doing his, in the middle of his opening, I, I can't remember what that's called, but the, the opening uh, monologue, yes. And, and this man, this particular man that he showed me was, is very prominent. I mean, he does it all the time for, for opening things. Well, anyway, and he, st he stops mid-sentence in one of his, just in the, in the middle of the, the, the monologue, and he starts cursing about Jesus. Well, I, here I thought he was going to start bashing the president and, you know, this and that and... But he, he, he went right for the, the religious aspect and, and, and started bashing Christians and, and Jesus Christ himself and um, saying that he was wicked and perverse and twisted and backwards and all of these things. And I immediately got mad. I was like, immediately, I just anger rose up and was like, he, he's talking about my Lord. You know, and 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 I immediately wanted justice. And that's when it got really interesting because it was I was stopped at that point, and the Lord spoke to me plainly and said, "Why are you angry, Jason?" And it got me, it knocked me down a couple steps because I knew that I knew what was coming next was you're not supposed to be, you know, this is, this is <laughs> just the way that he spoke it to me. I said, but because he's, he's telling lies about you. He's, 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 you know, everything about you, all these things are, are incorrect and, 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 and justice needs to be served. He needs to be set straight. That was my first that was that was my first response, and so often I believe that 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 that's our first response in a lot of cases towards people. And let me just go on because I know that this isn't this isn't this shouldn't be our first response. He said, "Why are you angry, Jason? Why are you angry?" I, I said and I told him, you know, this this is why it's obvious why I'm angry. He knew he knew himself why I was angry. He was just asking me and see if I knew. And I and I re, you know I repeated to him why. And he said, "Do you really think that you need? I need you to protect my reputation." And immediately I thought, you know, I didn't answer right away. And I was like, let me think about this. He made himself of no reputation, but he is the God of all. He doesn't need me to protect his reputation, make him look good. You know, he doesn't need me to set that, that particular person straight. So this was a rebuke, the whole, the whole, the whole nine yards was a rebuke, but it was at least lovingly enough to where it made me think first before, you know, it made me think about it, chew on it, what the Lord was speaking to me. He says, look again, Jason, what do you see? And while he was speaking, the speaker started, his neck started swelling up and it got really huge and he started getting real fat. And, it, and sweat started pouring off of him. And he st was still cursing about Jesus. And his big double chin was bouncing up and down. And he looked like a, he was a wreck. He was a complete wreck. And, it was, and he looked like he smelled. I mean, it looked, he looked bad. And I, and I said, well, what I, what I perceive is that those things that he's accusing and that are coming out of his mouth 
or things in him. And it's, you know, that's the perception. That's, that's what I discern on that. And he said, right, right. He said, yes, Jason, a wicked and perverse generation only sees wicked and wickedness and perversion. They, they, have, they have little else to go by. They have no moral compass, but yet anything of God is silly to them, is nonsense. Hearing even, even you know, people listening to this, you know, what I'm explaining is going to, some people are going to say that it's absurd. He actually hears from God. He's a looney tune. He hears voices, you know. But what, 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 what really transpired here was, you know, he said, rightfully so, that's, that's what happens. Sinners act like sinners. So why would you, why would you judge that, you know, and, and try to set them straight? They're, they're going to act like the, their father is the devil. But he sent me to another place and said, but what's my heart, Jason? Where am I in this picture is basically what he was asking me. Where am I? What, what, what am I here for? And I tell you what, there's two times in my life that I felt this presence when he said those things, this overwhelming compassion and, and love just overwhelmed me like hot oil. As I was looking at the same picture and had still had the same discernment, this hot oil of, of love penetrated from my head down to my feet. And I, and I went, he's without hope. And he said, right, Jason. He says, I want you to give them hope because it's a world without hope and they need me and that's why I died for them. I don't care about what they say about me but it's what I could do for them. But we need you. I need you. He needs us to be his hands and his feet. He needs us to be able to express that love and that consideration, that empathy, that compassion. The only two times that I've ever felt that same immense, powerful feeling of that overwhelming love is I, got a, I, I had the chance to see both my daughter and my son be born. And as soon as they were born, it was like, flooded me and it was exactly the same feeling like like that that person that that situation that I was seeing he loved and cared for that person just like it was it was a one of his and and he we are one of his but he he felt that same way so the you know and you look at the 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 age and it everything is anger 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 frustration arguments you know try to figure out what they're what they're telling you and and try to come come up with something clever to come back at them with you know that kind of thing but we're missing we're missing the 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 most beautiful part of christianity and and how to make the people's hearts melt when, when they're spitting out and spewing out perverse things, when they need hope so that they could change the perverse things in them, they only need hope. They need Christ. When you see that, you don't get angry right away. You go, oh man, I, if I have something in me that can fulfill and change part of them so that they can have some type of transformation in their life. Let's see it done. Amen? 
We do. We have what's real and what's living and what's flowing out of us if we allow it to flow out of us and we, we receive wisdom from above, which is pure. We can speak to them in, in a, in a, in, and it would be fruitful. It would be timely in a compassionate way. We don't have to argue against something that is, maybe even part of it might be true and hurtful. But that's not the point. The point is love. <laughs> we, we can't just let them go and, you know, let them go in their sin. And we can't just confront them point blank because we just, we're just making arguments. But if we show, if he shows us how to get in and to, to deliver that little nugget of hope, if he gives us a little door, a little crack in the door, and we're able to give a little nugget of hope to them, that's what they need. That's the difference between being a Christian and, and just saying that you are. If you can't give somebody hope that is completely a wreck, a complete hopeless wreck, then what are we here for? It's, it's interesting that there was, there was a comedian that had several years back got born again and, and actually had a really good, um, a really good conversion. And you, you don't usually see that in Hollywood. But he said, you know, if, if Jesus is who he says he was, then he's here right now. And if he's not here right now, then he, why bother with life? There, it, life is meaningless. And there's no other way to break from, uh, free from an addiction, an, an, any type of addiction, without God's help. Um, and, and you know, there, there's that, that Al, um, Al-Anon, which is for the AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and then there's Al-Anon, which are fam- friends and family. But they all believe in the higher power. They all talk about the, you know, the higher power. And But he went the next step after all his drug and, and alcohol I- issues. And he was like, there, there is no true freedom from any type, any form of addiction except for Jesus, except for Jesus, period. And we, we know that we know the answer. You know, what was funny was after I was, I was kind of reiterating what, what God had spoken to me and he was showing me the, the, the three things and, and the three things that he had showed me was, Jason, why are you angry? And I said, first of all, he's showing me three different types of discernment. Discernment in the natural is based on your senses, which could be earth, it's sensual wisdom even. It's how it affects you, what you see, what you smell, what you, you taste, what you touch. Perceive facts and figures. And that was what happened in the first. I took in what, what I saw in the natural and said, this is what I see. This made me angry. That's natural discernment. Where my dad and I live are, are, is kind of, is in, the next, is in the next level. And this is where I, I've always been, even in my really rough shape. The second level of discernment was the spiritual level. I can, dis, I can discern what's going on in, the, in, the, in man's spirit. The Lord just, it, that, that's, it was like, it's very natural to me. The third level is discerning the Spirit of God. And this is so necessary. Because it goes beyond so-and-so is having an issue with this in their life. And I, and I know, you know, the, the Lord's speaking this to me and I feel it. Or this person is sad or this person is joyful. It goes beyond that to the Spirit of God discerning His Spirit and what's going on and what He wants to do, what He's doing in that person. That's the most edifying part of everything. It gets you out, it gets you away from the, 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 the natural discernment, which is just picking up what people are portraying in their face. And, you know, if they're limping, you say, oh, they had a bad, there's something wrong with their hip, they're in pain, you know. 
but it goes beyond even the fact that you can you can see that there's some people that are that are hurting there's there's certain things that i had had spoke about um about the father because i knew that several of you in here had issues with father in the natural and that's why i hold i i spoke on the whole dynamic because a lot of things that happen with the, in our natural we have that reflect on the father on god the father that is not fair <laughs> And in order to get the most out of our walk, we really need to, to die to some of those things and allow him to fill those gaps and those voids that we've had. Some of us haven't had fathers. Some of us have had really bad fathers. Some of us have really good fathers. But regardless, it's sometimes natural for us to reflect those things upon him, and it's not fair. So that's why I took you through those some of those things a couple weeks back as far as how he sees us as the precious pearl and so on. But what is what is his heart in every situation? When you come across the certain thing that makes you angry, check yourself. Ask, bounce it off of the Lord. I know he spoke plain, just plainly to me like this, and, and I wish that this happened all the time. <laughs> Don't you? You have a question and he just answers, just like you're, you're standing next to him. He sometimes does. And this was and this was a fantastic way. And I mean, even though it was a, you know, an admonition on on his part, it was, you know, a correction on his part to me. I still felt all the love of the world behind it. You know, he's my he's my father. But we need to be able to find a place to deposit that hope. Show us. When we're, when we're confronted by people that are falsely accusing us of things, to not get all up in arms, start sweating and getting mad and trying to defend ourselves, God doesn't need you to defend him. He needs you to deposit hope in those people, to catch them off guard with, with a loving word, to invite them over for dinner. What's the scripture say? Be kind because it's like heaping hot coals on their heads. <laughs> it throws them off guard. It's made, it's purposely made to do that so that they open, they're open to that hope. What I thought was really interesting too is, is the way that he was speaking to me brought me to a particular scripture and I want to read it to you in this, in this Bible Uh, Jonah chapter 4. Everybody knows the story of Jonah, Jonah and the whale. But the way that the Lord was speaking to me, Jason, why are you angry? It reminded me of the scripture. So I thought maybe I'll just go ahead and read through this and see if it pertains to anything. <laughs> in chapter 4, basically it starts in Jonah was supposed to prophesy over Nin, uh, to Nineveh that, that God was very angry, and if they, you know, if they don't get their stuff together, then he was going to be punishing them. But Jonah wanted to, not to do that because he didn't feel that it was fair that God would forgive them. Anyway, starting in verse 4, it says, and this is right after Jonah had spoke to them, and God repented of his evil towards them and said basically that they'll, that they'll live and, and everything will be okay. But this, 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 but it deplete, displeased Jonah greatly and he was angry. Why, why was he angry? It displeased Jonah greatly that he actually forgave Nineveh because he didn't feel like they, should, they deserved it. <laughs> Point blank. He prayed to Jehovah and said, Ah, Jehovah, was this not what I said what was, that was going to happen It was still in my, while I was still in my land? Therefore, I anticipated it by fleeing to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, long-suffering and abundant in loving kindness and repentant of evil. In the beginning, that's why he ran away in the first place. 
He's like, I know that he's going to forgive these people if I go and make them repent or if I go and prophesy to them that God is angry. This is how much he didn't want them for, to be forgiven. And now, Jehovah, take my life, I pray for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And Jehovah said, do you do well to be angry? And I was just like, oh, man, this is exactly how he was speaking to me. Do you do well to be angry? If there's anything that you walk away from today and you ever, or, you know, you're getting road rage or you're doing whatever, think of that phrase and, and think of it as the Lord is speaking to you. Do you do well to be angry? It might make you think, it might, he might give you some wisdom on that. He didn't answer him. He didn't answer God when he asked that question. He said, it, it, the, the scripture goes on in verse 5, Then Jonah went out from the city, and he sat to the east of the city, and he made a booth for himself there, and sat underneath it until <clears throat> in the shade until he could see what would happen to the city. So he basically was sitting there and watching. And Jehovah God prepared a castor oil tree, which is a, a, a plant with giant leaves that grows really quickly. Um, it's a, a gourd plant. Um, and it came up over Jonah to be a shade over his head that it might deliver him from, the, from his misfortune, which was the, the hot sun. Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the tree. He was so happy that this tree was there. And when the sun rose, God prepared, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, but God prepared a worm. And when the dawn came up the next day, it struck the tree and the tree withered. And then the sun rose. God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head and he fainted. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. He was so adamant about these people not having forgiveness that he would rather die. <laughs> There's no, like, what? <laughs> this poor, <laughs> this guy, he needs, a, he needs a heart change. And God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry about the tree? And he said, I do well to be very angry, very angry, angry unto death. And Jehovah said, you had pity on the tree that, that you did not labor for, nor cause to grow, which came into being overnight and perished overnight. And I, should I not have pity on Nineveh, the great city in which are more than 120,000 people who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and many cattle. It was like this This was the whole first part of what the Lord was speaking to me. You get so angry sometimes at what they, what they say because it hurts your feelings. <laughs> but, it's, but it's immediate. It's almost like stubbing your toe on a stone. Oh! You know? But you... What's God's heart? It's compassion. It was compassion for a people that, wasn't, that, that weren't like Jonah, which was, uh, he was Hebrew. He felt that, that God it was just for the Hebrew, for the Jewish people, and that was it. But what, what God was speaking to me, even through what he was showing me, is he is for everyone. He died for everyone. And it and, and includes the people that you think are despised, that you think are ignorant, that you think are mean, that are unloving. It's for them people especially. Especially the ones that treat you horribly. He died for them. We need that door of hope to be cracked. We need to have that word in season that can get in through their senses, just like Jesus used the parables to get into their senses 
what the kingdom of God was about, the spiritual things of God. We need to have wisdom, pray for wisdom to speak that, just that one word that goes into that crack that blossoms and grows, that gives them hope. You know, there's so many things that we do. You know, we, we I was told, you know, growing up or even in, even in, in some instances in, in Bible school where you can't change everybody. You can't go in and change everybody. Sure, that, of course you can't. And that's not your job to do. So that you just be an example. So you just go and, do, but see, we've taken that be an example be a, as a Christ follower but we've taken it too, too far to where we've separated ourselves. We're just a follower of Christ. They, they'll follow us if they see that there's something good that we have. But we're actually ignoring the people. We can't. That's not what we were designed for. We were supposed to, yes, follow Christ. But not just follow him as far as he's leading me. Follow him from in here. And, and do what he would be doing. Not f just doing good works. Doing what the Bible says. But actually living his life through us. Is what he, what he meant by being a follower. A real true follower. And what did he do? I mean just in a picture in, in the scriptures. He sat with the tax collectors. He sat with the despised. He sat with the hated. And did you think that everybody said nice things about Jesus? But it didn't matter. It, it bounced off of him. It just fell off of him because of the immense amount of love coming out. Now we can't, it doesn't, this doesn't say grace leaves, you know, it's just all grace, 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 and it leaves everybody in their sin. No. It's It's love. Grace giving, giving you the ability to hear from God, to, to be able to be clean, you know, and receive that precious, pure wisdom from, from heaven and be able to speak life into people. It's, it's, it's more about, it's, instead of just reading people in the natural, saying that this person's going through something, this person, it's different than, than reading the human spirit where this person's broken and this person needs a father, this person. But it's about reading the, the Spirit of God in the room, in the presence, and, and how much He loves us. And what does He want? Lord, what do you want? He wants to be able to make Himself known. He wants to be able to be expressed through us. He wants us to get out of the way so that people have hope. Jason, show them hope. There's a, there's a lost and dying world out there who is angry and bitter because they don't have hope to deal with their anger and bitterness. They feel like they, they don't know what to do. They have, they have no... The, the progression of, of society and... and, and and social aspects is they call it progression, but they have nowhere to stand on. They're, they're progressing to where? From where? They have no idea. You know? And it's, and it's sad, but if we would actually just pray for his heart, pray that we get his heart, pray that we get a uh, new compassion, you know, not just empathy, oh, they, you know, so, you know, that's, it's okay. But for the people that are, perp like, accusing, point, I see, I just keep seeing people pointing and yelling and being angry. For those people that are in your face, that are questioning your belief system, you don't get angry back. You, you, you go back down into the Spirit of the Lord and you ask, What do they need? Because they need something. And I guarantee you the answer is hope. Amen. Do you want my big Bible?
I don't, I don't want that big Bible. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord's been speaking attitude, and we covered it last week, and I strongly suggest if you didn't get last week's message, listen to it on YouTube. It's very important. God's basically teaching us and bringing us into a level of discernment where <clears throat> we've got to graduate upon nitpicking and fault finding. And in reality, that what Jason's calling the first level of discernment is basically just fault finding and judgmentalism and interpreting with the reasoning mind. I could do that without being saved, couldn't you? And it's basically through the eyes of fear. Real discernment has to be through the eyes of Jesus, but it has to come from the heart of Jesus. You can't see with the eyes of Jesus till you have the heart of Jesus. And like Jason said, from the time he was little, we had our own language because we could perceive in the spirit very easily what was uh, going on in someone else. But even then, even at that second level, the goal is always redemption is the name of the game and it's never changed. Your discernment means nothing if you're accurate without application. And the, the strongest time the Lord ever taught me that, it's not good enough to have that kind of discernment. I can remember standing in front of that girl. She had walls of rejection. Like my first thought was, why is she even getting prayer? She's just all walled off. And I started to walk to the next person. And the Lord said, don't do that. And I went, whoops. And I went back there. And I just dropped down to my spirit and I just let love flow. I didn't know what to say to her at that point in time. She, had, she was just walled off. And I just kept releasing love. Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. The next thing you know, I, I felt something shaking on the inside of her. And then it dropped. It was like just like the wall came down. And she burst into tears and said, Jesus really does love me. But if I would have walked over here to that next person and ignored her, she had what? Walls of rejection. What do you think would go on in her head when I walked in the next person, huh? Come on, you've been there. There's people quit going to church because of something like that. And quite frankly, most of your offenses are in the realm of the devil's kingdom. It's in the realm of the natural. It's the eyes of fear. That's basically, I don't care, the best of you, you see through eyes of fear unless you're seeing through the eyes of Jesus. And you will plug in what you don't know with some kind of an answer. And it's usually negative. And the anger that he was talking about, you know what? We see people all the time angry at themselves to the point where they, I just want to end it all. And, and a lot of times these are Christians. You know what it is? It's an anger problem. You just turned it inward. Depression, that's just anger toward inward. It's because you're no longer seeing with the eyes of Jesus. You're just seeing in the natural. And you could do that without being saved. There's a <clears throat> something I just read recently. You know, we've been talking about where God's trying to bring us to this third level. That, that, that we discern the Word by knowing Him as a person. It's not just ink on a page, right? We know that the, the Spirit gives life. And we want to know the Word of God as a person. All things are naked and open the eyes of Him. That second level is basically to be able to know what's going on inside of you. We traveled church to church for 12 years and found people were believers for 20, 30 years and had, didn't have a clue as to what was going on inside of them. They just stayed in the reasoning mind and tried to figure Christianity out. If I or Jason could discern what's going on in somebody's spirit, we are bearing witness to 10% of what's going on in them. How much more with your anointing that abides within you should you be learning from the Spirit yourself as to what's going on in you. You shouldn't have to have someone outside of you telling you what's going on inside of you. It just shows the low level of awareness of that relationship of intimacy with God. I've seen people move in the gifts quite, quite uh, uh, regularly and still lacked intimacy. Is that scriptural? Is that possible? Why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? I knew you not. Depart from me, you work lawlessness. You can, you, can, you can be moving in the gifts and still avoid that intimacy. 
and you can build your whole life around that. But God's saying, I want to take you to the third level of the sermon. And that is, I want you to respond to the world around you. This is the challenge. This sounds like pie in the sky, and it sounds difficult, but I'll tell you what, God will take a people who, if you can see it, you can have it. He's taking us to Colossians 1.11, where it says, how to be steadfast and patient with joy. Colossians 1.11. Now, wait a minute. Steadfast has to do with all circumstances. Patience has to do with all people. With joy. Is that going to require a supernatural transition? With all of life with joy? And what God showed me as a, um, after I was saved about 14 years, He would prompt me to say, Lord, teach me how to pray. And when He, when he prompted me, there were like seven major revelations over a period of six months. Revelation number four, and you've heard it preached again and again here, was the beauty of attitude determines your performance. And we've been talking about the difference between resilience and resentment, and they're opposites. Resentment is the opposite of resilience, the ability to bounce back. And we talked a little bit about uh, boys and girls that were raised in, in situations that you would think they would never make it. And yet they seem to thrive, a small percentage, but it was a percentage nonetheless. And so this guy did research to see what happened. A little boy whose mother was an alcoholic, father was missing, would go to school, take two pieces of bread and make a sandwich and go to school with a smile on his face and didn't want, to, didn't want sympathy or pity from anybody. And he'd eat that bread sandwich with nothing in it just so that people wouldn't feel sorry for him. They, they, they had a way of being resilient to the circumstances. And here's the key. This guy discovered, this is secular, it's 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. Those are the people that, that made it. 90% attitude, 10%. Now, I knew that in the natural. And when God was teaching me how to pray, he, he got to this fourth revelation called Attitude Determines Your Performance. And he showed me the beautiful revelation of forgiveness, that there's positive and there's negative, but the only true positive that transforms lives is the cross. If you try to avoid the cross, you can be as positive as you want to be. It's not going to last. It's not going to work. It's nice compared to being negative. <laughs> but the only true positive was forgiveness. And it had to flow to God, for your, especially in circumstances that you get mad at Him. And Jason brought up that anger. This is so typical of even physical pain. If you were walking barefoot in a field, and all of a sudden you're enjoying the sunshine, you're enjoying the bright day, beautiful day, and your toe jams into a sharp rock and there's excruciating pain that goes all the way up. The flesh almost automatically in every case will go, why did God let me find the only rock in the field? Or, oh, Dennis, you are so stupid. You managed to find the only rock in the field. Or, who's the farmer that didn't take the rocks out of his field? Pain, anger, blame. And what the Lord showed me, you want to deepen your prayer life, then attitude will determine your performance, that it's how you respond to the situations of life. And from that point on, I quit asking why. I don't ask God why questions. I ask, how do you want me to respond? And that will save a lot of grief and a lot of aggravation. So I basically said that if this attitude determines performance. The only true positive is forgiveness. Forgiveness has to deal with the, with the obstacles, the things that are standing in the way, and how to respond. He should, the more important part is the other side of the cross, and that I noticed from the very first time God showed me that if you proficiently allow forgiveness to flow and it removes the hurt, the pain, the anger, if you allow it to flow, pay attention that after the barriers removed, what's flowing is love. 
And when that love is flowing, you basically have the eyes of Jesus during that time. And God can give you a redemptive solution for whatever. God will basically, He'll speak to you clearly for application. Now there's times when people don't want to do anything, but there's no excuse for you not to release love to them. If they choose not to respond, that's, that's their business. But very often, I just heard a testimony of a person who was witnessing in a restaurant and the waitress got extremely indignant. And before he left the restaurant, and she was blatantly mean because of this Jesus stuff, you know, he doubled, the tip was equal to what the meal cost. Next thing you know, he was walking out the door and she came running out and said, I'm so sorry, I just had such a bad day. Why? She expected you to blow her off just the way she blew you off. That's what they expect from Christians. To just basically just ignore me. But he doubled the tip. Isn't that interesting? Doubled it. And she didn't know what to do with that. And went to the door and said, I've been having a really bad day. And he was able to lead her to the Lord. Isn't that something? You know, love, love will speak a lot louder than, than all of your judgments. Amen. And I believe that God is trying to take us to that, to that third level. Um, how do we respond? Remember, what are the three levels? You read the word, you want to meet the author of the word. That's level one. I want to know him as a person. It's not ink on a page. He's not a doctrine. He's a person. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. And I want Him to separate flesh from spirit. I want to have the eyes of Jesus, but I know that I have to have the heart of Jesus. While you're angry, you have no discernment. I'm sorry. Whatever you're coming up with while you're angry is not discernment. It's judgment. And you're seeing in the devil's realm of fear, kingdom of fear. And you're interpreting based on that kingdom. How many people have been offended by interpreting somebody's action or lack of action, and you got offended by something that was non-existent. Now, whose fault is that? Huh? It's because of our response. It's not because of their action or reaction. It's because of our response. We responded based on what we plugged in from the realm of fear. God says, <clears throat> Remember that time we were kneeling by a couch in uh, West Haven, Connecticut. And God says, let this attitude be in you. And all of a sudden I saw what we called core values. How many have had teaching on core values here? Okay, it's a handful. Have this attitude. I looked at that portion of scripture and God basically said, these are core attitudes and these are good. I know what Jason's is. Jason's was always justice. Could you hear that in his message? Justice. Uh huh. I could still remember when he was real young, he came in, Dad, there's unsaved kids in the Sunday school. He didn't feel that was fair. They were, they were privy <laughs> to the benefits without being saved. How dare they? Well, what should we do? Take them out back? Shall we get rid of them? But if you look at the attitude that was in Jesus, the first attitude was he made himself of no reputation. How many of you would not be offended if you made yourself of no reputation? If it was basically like, I'm, I'm not demanding any kind of prestige or equality. The second attitude that was in Jesus, well, he didn't want equality, so he made himself of no reputation. The second attitude that I found remarkable was in the church, we have difficulty with serving. Well, I don't want to serve. Nobody's going to put me under bondage. And yet Jesus voluntarily made himself a bondservant. And what I saw was Jennifer and I's core value. We got messed with on that one, didn't we? Our core value is personal freedom. Don't fence me in. Don't micromanage me. <laughs> anybody, does that trigger anybody? 
Don't micromanage me. Don't fence me in. I got to be free. And Jesus' personal freedom, the attitude that was in him, was basically, he just said, he chose to be a little bondservant of the Lord Jesus, a volunteered servant. Uh-oh. Anybody got personal freedom? You feel like that's one of your core values? These core values are good if they're used righteously. But when you demand them, right? Equality is a good thing for you to treat other people with that equality. You demand it, and you're going to get in trouble. Loyalty, personal freedom, justice, all of those are core values. And have this attitude that was in Jesus, and that attitude that was in Jesus in Philippians 2, was, was, did anybody make him be a servant? I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom. Wow. That's an attitude. Equality with God was not a thing to be grasped. He made himself of no reputation. That's an attitude. Personal freedom really got us, didn't it, Jennifer? When we first got married, if Jennifer was at the computer and I stood over her shoulder, whoa, she would go, uh, pardon me? <laughs> huh? Does that push anybody's button? Well, guess what? That's not the attitude that was in Jesus. He chose to be a bondservant. What's the third attitude? Loyal. Oh, boy. I see this one in church. The attitude in Jesus was loyal. How loyal was he? To the point of death? Wow. You know what I see in the church with loyalty? After all I did for you. That's a loyalty only in regards of getting back in return. Unsaved people can do that. Huh? Love those that love you back. But the last one, that was Jason's. How loyal was he? To the death of a cross, the just for the unjust. And God wants to bring us in that realm of, of, of loving relationship with him, the just for the unjust. In other, words, in other words, you need to be able to see those that are performing injustices and release love to them. And look, in that release of love, you could possibly get discernment of application as to how. Jason talked about ministering hope to them. It can be more specific than that. You can actually have a word for them in season or an action like that man that doubled his tip. That doesn't work for everybody. That's not a system or a method. It's the wisdom of application when the heart is right. When the heart's not right, hmm? I, I've heard from people that, that are in, uh, in food services that Christians are sometimes lousy tippers. That's a bad witness. Huh? So, have this attitude that was in Jesus. But here's the thing that I feel, and I want to close with this. Here's the thing that I'm seeing a pattern of. In my first pastorate, the children used to sing a song that it was a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil. Anybody ever heard that one? That's a famous one, huh? Big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil. But even the secular researcher said that your response to trauma is based on how you take in the experience. And you can make it bigger. That's the one problem with this thing up here between our ears. You can make it bigger than it really is. But for a believer, you've got a big, big God. You've got an itsy bitsy devil. I still remember when I was dying, they told me I was dying of pneumonia as a young believer. And I was laying there and I could hear the roar of that thing that's, you're going to die. And my whole body trembled with it. <laughs> but from down here, the, I, I was I mean I was getting to the point where I was delirious. I was seeing Mickey Mouse cartoons and everything. <clears throat> but down in my spirit, I could still hear, "No, you're not." 
No, how come, how come the no you're not was so quiet and that you're going to die is so loud? Volume has nothing to do with it. We make it big. There's no such thing as, well, pastor, I'm struggling. It's so big. You made it big. I'm not saying it's not serious because we all run into serious stuff. But you make it big. What did the children of Israel do with the giants? We're like grasshoppers. They made them big. Hmm? We are but, we're but grasshoppers in our own eyes. Yeah, that's the problem. It's how you looked at yourself. You need to start seeing that it's a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil, right? Have this attitude that was in Jesus. You say, how do I respond to this? Wow, everything's falling apart. How do I respond to that? And you'd be surprised how God will take you and move you and direct you in ways you would have never thought of, nor were you smart enough to do it, it with the reasoning mind, and you come out smelling like a rose. How many remember that cartoon, uh, Mr. Magoo? I'm telling you, it works. If you would just trust God and go, I don't know, God, what do I do now? How do you want me to respond now? Everything's falling apart. You would, ju you would just... You would just walk through in the, in the will and the purposes of God. I don't care if everything fell apart around you. You would come out smelling like a rose. It was almost like, I meant to do that. <laughs> no, you wouldn't want to say that. I had a friend that was, did crazy things all the time. And he says, he says, I always tell people I meant to do that. He said, I do so many crazy things all the time. I have to have an excuse. But we don't need any excuses, right? We just need to know how to respond. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.